Barker. I'm co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And we are currently, where we're filming now, is in Madison, Wisconsin, which is the national headquarters of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I started here uh, as a worker in 1987, and then Annie Laurie and I became co-presidents. We were married in 87, we became co-presidents in 2004. Yes, Annie Laurie and I met on Oprah Winfrey show in Chicago, which was really fun. In fact, that was the first time I ever met any other and talked with any other atheist in my life, and it was on a live TV show in Chicago. And it was the first time I'd ever publicly spoken about my atheism to any group, okay. much less to a hostile audience. So, um, Were they hostile? Yeah, it was great. It was really great because Oprah's producers had packed that audience with a bunch of Bible thumpers. So here I was, a few months earlier I was preaching the gospel, and now here I was on live TV before this audience, and uh, I, was, I was being asked to say things I'd never said before about my atheism and that. And Annie Laurie and her mother, Ann Gaylor, who founded the Freedom From Religion Foundation, they were the other guests. So that's the day we met, and that was a pretty exciting thing. That was 84. We got married in 1987, which is the year that I started, uh, started working here as PR director. The summer of 83, that I knew I was an atheist, but I kept preaching for four or five months because I had this calendar of speaking engagements. I was more like a, an evangelist and I didn't know how to stop it. And so it took until December of 83 when I finally said enough. I was, I was preaching and singing at a church in California and I, I decided no more. And I sent a letter in January of 84. I sent out a letter to everybody. And, uh, and then a few months later, I joined the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And it was September of that year that I went on that Oprah Winfrey show. So it was really, what? eight or nine months earlier that I had left and I sent out that letter. So it was, it was still really fresh in my mind. I was very conservative, Bible-believing, born-again, evangelical, uh, charismatic, if you know what that means, uh, all of the gifts of the Spirit and all of that. But in my preaching, I was not one of these mm -hmm. yelling type. Uh, I, I was sort of calm and relaxed, and here's what the Gospel says, and I trusted that the Word of God would do the work without a bunch of loud theatrics. But somewhere around the age of 30, when I was doing cross-country evangelism because of my Christian music, I started meeting not just pastors in churches that were the same theology as me. I started meeting more moderate and even some liberal preachers as I was traveling around. I, I talked with hundreds of pastors. And so there was a migration that started within Christianity. I thought it was a spiritual growth of becoming more sophisticated and more mature. And I remember an early thing that happened was when a pastor of a church, before the meeting, we were praying in his office that God would bless my ministry. As a, I was a visiting minister at his church. Uh, and he said there were some people in his church who didn't think Adam and Eve were actual historical people. They thought Adam and Eve was more of a metaphor or a parable just like Jesus told parables of the prodigal son and the Good Samaritan, never intending people to think there actually was a prodigal son or a Good Samaritan. These were stories that were told to illustrate an important moral or spiritual truth. And this pastor had members of his congregation who thought that the early Israelites did the same thing with the Adam and Eve story. They never intended it to be literal people. It was a parable that was told. Now, I remember thinking, whoa, there's Christians who actually think that? And uh, I thought Adam and Eve were actual people. But these people, the pastor told me, they said, what we know from science and evolution is there could not have been a first man, a first father and a first mother. That's impossible. And even if there had been, they would have come out of Africa, not out of the Middle East, some Garden of Eden. And I remember thinking, boy, that's heresy. That's really, you know. And what happened in my brain was not to doubt Adam and Eve. What happened way back in those early days of thinking was that I realized that I should not let a theological difference like this stop me from fellowshipping with other Christians who might hold a different view from me. 
So that was sort of a beginning early step toward becoming more liberal in my thinking and not so hard-nosed, absolutistic, you know, binary brained mm -hmm. uh, fundamentalists to where I could embrace maybe a little bit of gray area within Christianity. And then I realized after a while that there is no one Christianity. There's all these different slices of Christianity. There might be as many Christianities as there are Christians. I mean, there's all these different points of view. And so I remember that Adam and Eve story got me thinking uh, that, oh, okay, I'm becoming more sophisticated now. I'm growing up. My theology doesn't have to be so hard-nosed. And these are good people who don't believe that Adam and Eve were historical, but they go to church and they pray and they, you know, they read the Bible. So I'll consider them to be fellowship in the, within the Christian community. So shades of gray, you're beginning to sort of yeah. be a little more... Yeah, it was shades of gray, which to a true fundamentalist, gray is, <laughs> is heresy. You can't have gray area. Even Jesus said you should be cold or hot, because if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. So a true fundamentalist has to be a split brain. Everything has to be good or evil, right or wrong, yes or no. There can't be any degrees of holiness or degrees of morality within the mind of a fundamentalist. I know not all believers are like that, but that's the way I was back then. And so that started a process of uh, a bit of theological, I would say, theological maturing, where I think most Christians today are not the fundamentalist types. Most Christians are more in the middle there. So I went through that phase. And that was the beginning of a process of my brain relaxing and becoming less absolutistic. Outwardly, I had this persona that was a preacher. And I was good at it. After many, many years of standing in front of a congregation, I knew what to say. In fact, after I knew I was an atheist for those four or five months, and I still kept preaching and hating it because I was a hypocrite, I should have stopped. But after that time, uh, I noticed something. I would get up and perform and, and preach the Word of God and, and do my sermons and all of that, knowing that I shouldn't be doing it. It was dishonest because I didn't believe it anymore, but it was like an act that you develop over the years. Uh, and after one of my sermons, a woman came up to me and she said, Reverend Barker, I want you to know I really felt the ministry of God and the Spirit of God on your sermon today. And I thought, you did? <laughs> because, because I knew at that time that I was a phony and a hypocrite. I knew that. And yet she was in the audience feeling something. And so that kind of shows you there's this drama that's being acted out. There would be no successful preachers if there weren't these audience congregations out there playing along with it. It's a game that goes. So there's this big drama. So while I was going through this process, inwardly, uh, outwardly, I still had that persona and I could still get up and do that. So my outward preaching was still pretty fundamentalist, even though my in internal dialogue was becoming more gray area and more uh, less absolutistic and more probabilistic. Um, and I remember thinking, Okay, like towards the end of that process, I remember thinking, so Jesus spoke in parables, and the parables have a message that's not necessarily historical and not actually true. There was no actual prodigal son. That was just a parable. And Adam and Eve then were more like a metaphor for the, uh, a founding myth for the nation of Israel kind of thing. Which, so the Adam and Eve were a metaphor. Well, then what other characters in this book are metaphorical. What about Yahweh? What about God himself? Maybe God himself is just one big figure of speech that the ancient Israelites and the early Christians put together, not really intending it to be true, but it's a story. And I thought, well, you know, well, then maybe Yahweh is also just this fictional device, which means he doesn't really exist as an actual being. And yet I was up talking as if he did, and the audience was responding as if it was real. There was this big dynamic going on. And that got me to really kind of question, well, what is the whole nature of social truth in the first place, or theological truth in the first place? And my Christian wife at the time, to her credit, uh, she was and remains a conservative believing Christian. 
to her credit, she tried to bend because I was her Christian husband and she was a help me to her husband. But she couldn't bend too far without breaking, it turned out. And she wanted to be a minister's wife. And so that was the primary cause of us agreeing that we would divorce and split up, which was painful. It was horrible. So I, that, that ended. Uh, of course, we're still good friends. We have the kids and the grandkids and all that. Are the kids uh, Christians or what? So the children are all over the place. Uh, a couple of them, I would say, are outright atheists and free thinkers. A couple of them are what you might call moderate or liberal believers. I think one of my daughters is a bit of a kind of new agey, you know. But when we get together, that doesn't matter. We don't talk about those things. We all love each other. Fortunately, we all have a good relationship in the family, and there's no shunning or excommunication or no preaching at each other. In fact, eventually, my mom and dad, who were both strong Christians, and mom was a Sunday school teacher and dad was a lay minister, they both became atheists too after a while, after I did. So in my family, I, I feel kind of lucky that we all love each other first. In spite of the fact that Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate your family, what he said. We never took that verse that seriously. We think family is more important than, than dogma. Wow.